Good evening, I'm Casey Nolan. I'd like to get a few things straight before we get started tonight. You don't have to bike to work or live in a loft or even work downtown for tonight's show to be important to you. Or so we're told. We're talking about downtown St. Louis drawing on our past to debate our future. So stay tuned. St. Louis has one of the most recognizable skylines in America. And when most outsiders think of St. Louis, they likely think Gateway Arch and the area surrounding it. But for many St. Louis natives, venturing downtown can be limited to catching an occasional ball game, concert, or maybe a marathon. Our urban core has made headlines lately. Macy's is closing. The couple station complex is losing a building, while renovations to the arch grounds and a new ballpark village are both on the horizon. So what does it all mean? What does our downtown have to do with our identity as a region and our success? Tonight, we explore the past, present, and the possibilities for the future. So stay tuned. Sixth and Olive, we were just looking at there. Uh, a man at the table who I'm sure recognizes those photos. Michael Allen joining us at our first table, the director and architectural historian with the Preservation Research Office. Also Frank DeGrath from Count On Downtown, a business consultant by day, blogger by night, I guess. And from the St. Louis Beacon, reporting extensively on this topic that we're talking about tonight, Jason Rosenbaum. All of you, don't go anywhere. If you would, before we start the conversation tonight, we're first going to Take a look back, as only Jim Kircher can, at the downtown past. There's never really been a time when downtown wasn't changing, growing or shrinking, things moving in, things moving out, things going up, and things coming down. Today, the talks about the fate of the couple's seven building and the fact that it will likely be torn down instead of being turned into residential or commercial use. There used to be 20 buildings here built along the rail yards as warehouses, and the fact that any of them survived from the 19th century into the 21st, well, that's a story in itself. But it's really the upcoming shuttering of Macy's, famous bar's old flagship store, that has people talking about the end of an era for downtown. But even that era, was fading 20 years ago when longtime St. Louis residents reminisced about what downtown used to be. Going downtown was a, that was Saturday. Saturday, you went downtown. You might not have had any money, but you went, you had enough of bus fare, you went downtown. It was just amazing. We went downtown to shop, of course. Malls were unknown. Downtown was very crowded by University City standards. When we were uh, shopping during the day, the streets were so crowded, they were six deep across the sidewalks. I saw a large group of people. I just saw a diversity of people. You didn't go downtown without your little white gloves and always a hat, always a hat with a streamer hanging down the back of your neck. Going somewhere, you, my mother said, always go there and, and look like you don't need it. Go there and look like you don't need it. She would dress up to go. Everybody, you, you just did not go looking like anything. In recent years, and I guess at this point, I mean a generation or more, people for the most part haven't been coming downtown for big shopping trips, grab a bite to eat, see a blockbuster movie. We do that at malls now. Suburbs took a lot of jobs from downtown as well. But what people have been coming downtown for is baseball. At Bush Stadium, either this one 
or the old one that was next door. And there was a time when that idea, downtown baseball, it was a game changer. And St. Louis wasn't the only city in the 60s to move its ballpark from a neighborhood, the north side in our case, to downtown. And here it came along with an arch, a new convention center, and yes, residential development. Not lofts in old buildings, but new apartments where old buildings had been torn down. There have always been plans for downtown. Some of them have worked, some of them not so much, and some of them never got much further than the drawing board. But through the years, a lot of people have agreed that what downtown is and what it isn't is an important part of what St. Louis is and isn't. For Stay Tuned, I'm Jim Kircher. So tonight we're trying to take the approach of past, present, future, just so you know where we're going. We're going to start with the past with the gentleman at the table now, all of which I know have a lot to say about the present <laughs> and the future. So, but we, we, we appreciate you uh, filling the role of past. So what we, we saw some of it there. We heard some of it there. What historically was the role of downtown? How has it changed? Oh, well, historically it wasn't downtown. I mean, that's one thing we have to start with. Back in the origin of the city throughout most of the 19th century, this was basically the city. This was the center of the city, and there was a microcosm of everything. The commercial activity, industry, residential, streets like Lucas Place, where the private places were, Washington and St. Louis universities. So as the city grew, all those activities sort of morphed outward and spread with the growth rings of the city, leaving downtown as sort of the central business district by the early 20th century. But I would have to say, like, uh, downtown has not been the downtown uh, that we think of when we think of center of offices and commerce oh, since the advent of the streetcar. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's changed, especially in the last 20 years, and I'm sure Frank will jump on this because he is living proof of that. Right. But instead of just being strictly a place where people go to work every day, it has become more residential. And that has had a reciprocal effect on the types of businesses that are downtown. For example, the fact that the population has increased so much is why there's demand enough for culinaria, or a movie theater, or boutique restaurants. It's, it's very evident that that had a huge impact on how downtown was shaped. Cul culinaria being the schnooks, just in case people don't know. And in a way, uh, you know, downtown is going back to the future. When you see those old pictures, uh, livelihood, streetcars. Yeah, did they film um, that during a Cardinals game as it was letting out? Because that's about yeah. the only time I would see that kind of density in the people on Probably the sidewalk. Probably not against yeah. the Marlins or anything no. like that. <laughs> But you, but you see, you know, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, uh, worldwide, you saw, uh, you know, suburbanization. People uh, would go farther from downtown. You see that it's being reversed uh, in the 80s, 90s. You saw it in Europe uh, happening, in some cities here in the United States. And since the early 2000s, you see that happening here in St. Louis. And you see that younger people, uh, 30 and under, they want to live downtown. They, wanna, they want that dynamic environment. They want to walk to work. And uh, so I think we can, all, we can learn a lot from the past. Okay, so how are the buildings playing a role in that? We, 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 we see some of the same buildings that old, in that old footage that we have today. Well, I mean, these are greatly adaptable buildings. And through historic tax credits and other uh, programs, we've been able to find new lives for them. Uh, but there's still this tension. I mean, and the loss of a building like Couple 7 really sort of indicates this um, between sort of the historic function of commercial buildings and the reality that downtown is not really a, a commercial center anymore. It's more of a neighborhood. It's more like what it once was in the 19th century, with a little bit of everything, and it's growing more predominant residential fabric. So, is that uh, good or bad? It's great, because yeah. people like to live in all these old buildings. Uh, the bad news is some of these purpose-built buildings can't you, you, be saved. You can't create another suburb that looks like a previously built suburb. You cannot create another downtown. It's a, a very unique environment. It's kind of a neighborhood plus. You know, you have the neighborhood feel, but you get a lot of visitors downtown. You, the, you know, there's people that go to baseball games, uh, tourists go see the arch. So it's, you, you get the neighborhood, you get the architecture, and you get the dynamics of uh, visitors uh, on a daily basis. And the fact that with this historic tax credit that Michael mentioned, it has really been, I would say, instrumental in turning some of the old factories on Washington Avenue into residential areas, into you know bars and restaurants. It made development easier for those types of businesses. And it really 
is, is obviously right now in the legislature a source of contention between some St. Louis legislators and more outstate ones, but it, it has you know, made a, quite a large impact on the complexion and the aesthetics of downtown for sure. You go ahead, Michael. Uh, so that's not, and that's not the only point of contention, and that's the historic tax credit sort of is feeding this organic development, but then there's still this historic civic impulse that goes back to the turn of the century where downtown is our, you know, the, the front door to the region, right? The front door to the city, and we want it to look a certain way. So big projects like Ballpark Village and the Arch Grounds makeover are sort of at odds with some of this more uh, organic uh, development. You mentioned neighborhood. We have about 30 seconds, but I know we're going to go to Ed for Twitter in just a second, but already on Twitter, I've seen people saying, I've actually moved out of downtown because it doesn't feel like a neighborhood. Well, you know, downtown is, that's why I call it a neighborhood plus. You know, if you really want the neighborhoody feel, maybe downtown's not for you. But if you want, it's, it's still a neighborhood, only it has a lot of extra dynamics. And downtown's not for everyone. And that goes for every downtown. Uh, I lived in the center of Amsterdam for uh, 10 years, and there were a lot. I got, it drove me crazy because it's so busy. Uh, I kind of like the feel of St. Louis right now. All right, we'll leave it there. And I want to ask you all to stick around and come back for the post show, which will be robust, I have no doubt. As I just alluded to, let's go to Ed Reggie. Ed, how is social media playing a role in tonight's show? Well, Casey, social media, of course, on Stay Tuned, plays a vital role. In fact, your voice drives the conversation. And in fact, I'm the one listening to you throughout the broadcast tonight. And earlier this week, I put out there, how does the current state of downtown look to you? And you all responded. In fact, we've been hearing all week comments ranging from what are the physical boundaries that make up a downtown district like in St. Louis and to everything about what, uh, what tech businesses and the new tech businesses and how they're helping our downtown region. Well, we want you to get involved and there's two ways. Uh, earlier today, we put a graphic up on our Facebook page and it's a question. We want you to go there on our Facebook page, the Nine Network, and answer, put your comments right there. We'll use them throughout tonight's broadcast or use the hashtag StayTunedSTL. Let's see what you're already saying. Okay, here at our next table. First, uh, back for the second week in a row, I believe. Uh, John Warren, Coldwell Banker, Richard Ellis, commercial real estate broker. CBRE. CBRE, fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also from Next STL, if, you, uh, if you're interested in tonight's show and you don't know X Next STL, you will after tonight. This is Alex Enan. Medora Kelly, policy analyst with East West Gateway. And Tim Bryant with the Post Dispatch, writes on all things development. Uh, a question I want you to ponder, we just saw on Twitter, what are the physical boundaries of downtown? It might be an important question to answer before we get started, but before I ask you that, I wanna to toss to a piece by our friends at STL Curator. Uh, they're gonna show us the man behind the MX, which is a development downtown. I'm Amos Harris, I'm the developer, I'm a principal of Spinnaker St. Louis, and we're the developer of the Mercantile Exchange District in yeah, downtown St. Louis. Any real conversation depends to some degree on trust, but the collaboration, uh, which is critical to the success of downtown, the collaboration between both um, private side folks as well as between the public side and the private side is critical. And some, you gotta have some level of trust just to get any of these projects done. How have you managed to facilitate that trust? Uh, we try to do what we promise. Yeah. So, you know, not promise what we can't deliver. Uh, an element of it is that, you know, people realize that there's potential here. They know that they can see that there's, that really it's a question of you making guys, sure you connect the dots in the right you guys way. Have been here before so a part of it is, is kind of telling a story that's compelling, that feels like it can happen, right? That's kind of the basic thing is if you, if you tell a story that's compelling and it feels like it can happen and you've got the right people in the mix, that, that's, those are the elements to success. 
Okay, thanks again to STL Curator. Uh, look at the uh, MX behind the scenes there. So, okay, uh, what are the boundaries of downtown? We should probably define that, what we're talking about here. Or do different people define it differently? They do. Um, I spoke a few weeks ago with a developer in the Grand Center Midtown area who was a proponent of the proposed streetcar from wherever downtown, out even in the Central West End. And he said, if that streetcar runs to his developments or other developments in the Midtown area, his market there immediately picks up the 6,000 hotel rooms downtown, and he considers that part of downtown. So, uh, but for the, tonight's conversation, a little and bit I, closer. And I think if people aren't familiar with downtown, you, get, you literally get people who think the Central West End is downtown. You know, they tell you they went downtown for dinner, and you ask where, and oh, the Central West End, right? Um, but I think in a practical sense, it's, it's, what, it's what you can walk to easily. You're not going to walk past 40 to the south. You're not going to go into the residential neighborhoods to the north. You're not going to go west of maybe Jefferson. So, okay. so it's really a compact area. Okay, so for the, this, this is the, the, the downtown present. I don't believe there's a downtown present ghost in this, but that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's another story. But the, we're in the present section of tonight's show. Uh, there's a lot of uh, meat on this bone. I kind of want to just get out of the way, but what, I'll just throw some things out there. Uh, Slu Law. Uh, Michael mentioned the couple station, uh, Ballpark Village. What is the state of downtown present? I think it's gotten nothing but stronger over the last, obviously, 10 years. We're certainly seeing more creative firms looking around downtown. Um, Anders, Minkler uh, moving downtown to 800 markets, a positive story from downtown Clayton. Um, and then there's also uh, just a number of other marketing, creative, professional firms as well that have moved back downtown. Certainly it's had more res has more residents now than ever before. But uh, it's, it's no longer the center, of, certainly not the center of retail, and it's lost other than sporting events. There's really not any entertainment downtown. The movie theaters have gone, the theaters have gone, uh, but you know, still you have thousands of people who have never lived there before, and that, that's likely to increase. We just saw a really nice movie theater in that piece at the MX. Is that well, not? okay, there's one nice movie theater. And is that significant? <laughs> great theater, exactly. It's it's a great great. I, I think yeah. it reflects the fact it's, it's, a, it's a neighborhood again. You know, I mean, the Central West End has a theater. You know, a lot of the South City neighborhoods had theaters, most of those are gone, but but the difference is it's a neighborhood. You have people, you have people living there, and the challenge is what, is what is downtown, whether it's St. Louis or other places, what's it going to be and who does it serve? And we're kind of at this point where it's a neighborhood. There are thousands of people living in downtown proper, but then it's also, you know, their streets are closed seemingly every other weekend for some big festival. So it's the regional festival center, it's the arch, it's the sports center, it's the professional sports area of our region, but it's also a neighborhood. And I think there's some, some um, I don't know, not real friction, but there's some real, you know, debate about which way we're going and what downtown looks like 20 years and, and Alex makes the good point that that the core of downtown is the walkable area but in other cities like Chicago Boston um, Toronto New York that where public transit also is frequent and available and perceived as safe that's where people travel day and night mm -hmm. and when people travel they spend money and that brings up everything economically Medora, are you new to St. Louis I am new. so give us your impression what is, what is your what is your impression of our downtown well, I only started working downtown about three months ago, and I grew up in Milwaukee. Um, so the few times that I had been to St. Louis before, the downtown had been kind of dead and vacant. I've been really enjoying getting to know downtown, working there, and seeing how much it's utilized during the day and uh, all the great parks and the arch grounds. During the day, mm -hmm. that's that's key. Am I? Is that, <laughs> we were talking just before that I, I spent a lot of time in Boston for work and over the last few years. And there are large parts of downtown Boston that close at 5.30. You know, the, the Starbucks is closed, no one's on the street, it's vacant, and people kind of move to the Back Bay area in South Boston. Well, that happens here too, it's just that our neighborhoods aren't really connected. So downtown may slow down if there's not an event, but people go to Soulard, people go to Lafayette Square, people go to the Central West End, Midtown now. So I don't know that, I think there's a perception sometimes that our downtown is, is too quiet. And I think that that, we just kind of suffer from the fact that maybe a lot of us haven't spent time in other downtowns, you know, and whether it's, regional comparisons like a Cincinnati or Indianapolis, um, we're not, I don't know that we're that much better or worse off. And then even the larger cities, I mean, there, there's, no, there's nothing that says downtown is lively all well, the time. I think you know? the biggest game changer for downtown is actually having people living there as well. In the past, you know, we've had uh, Union Station, St. Louis Center, unfortunately those projects ultimately failed, but now with people living downtown, the retail has followed, and ultimately I think more and more creative office users will come back downtown. I was actually talking with a number of office brokers the other day, and if you're trying to find a Class A large vacant space downtown, there really aren't many options. Now, as you go down into the B and C spaces, there are more, but for a Class A, a Met Square, a Peabody building, there really aren't that many What's good holding spots. downtown back? That's what they want to know on Twitter. They're, Ed's getting that to us. What's the, uh, what's the challenge? What's, what's the I think the perception of, of crime. 
I think it's the biggest challenge to downtown. I don't know if you would agree yeah, with that. Yeah, I think probably so, but I, I would also, in a sense, challenge the fact that there's anything holding downtown back. It's, it's an incredible place. It's a fabulous place. You know, we have all these amenities downtown. It's used all the time. Peabody Opera House is full. We sell out hockey games. We sell out baseball games. We almost sell out football games. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with downtown. I think downtowns everywhere are changing drastically, and we're in the middle of that. Um, we were talking earlier, too, and I think you're saying, you know, Denver doesn't have a downtown shopping district. Um, Houston lost their downtown Macy's. You know, we're not immune to those things, too. And so I'm not so sure that anything that's happening downtown here is a symptom of any and quote, something's problem, going right? on right now. A couple of interesting reports out this week, and John, one of them, your shop, the, uh, the, the St. Louis Office Market View. And CBRE found that the downtown office market is eh, it's kind of stagnant. It's, it's not really going up or down. But Collier's International said, hey, in the last year, or this year so far, that downtown has picked up a lot of occupancy in uh, office space, that rents are up somewhat, and uh, in contrast, that the overall uh, market occupancy or office occupancy in Clayton has dropped some. The big difference is, and John knows this, that, that office lease rates are so much higher in Clayton than they are in downtown. That certainly would be a drawback well, to yeah, developing Well, let me stop downtown. you, John. We've got to cut it off there. Go back sure. to social media real quick, because I know we've got a lot more to talk about, but we want to make sure we keep you engaged online as well. then and now with the fountain down along Market Street there on the, kind of the west end of downtown. Okay, let's go to our baseball rival and talk about our downtown. No, not the Baby Bears where our team is this weekend, but Cincinnati. Uh, joining us via Google Hangout from Cincinnati, David Ginsburg with Downtown Cincinnati, Inc. David, can you hear me? Because I can't see you, but I'm trusting that you can hear me. I can hear you fine, Casey. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so if you, you, you can hear me, then I trust you've heard the conversation so far. I'm curious. Anything uh, resonating, anything familiar? These are so many of the same conversations we have here in Cincinnati. Uh, I can tell you that when we first got this uh, revitalization work started uh, in the late 90s, downtown meant the central business district. It was basically an, an office market, rolled up the sidewalks at 5 o'clock. Uh, safety was the big problem. Uh, the perception of safety was a big problem. Um, whether we would have residential or retail or office. You know, what was going to lead the revitalization? These were all the questions that were, we were asking. Now we're asking the question, what is downtown? Uh, is it center city? Is it the neighborhoods that are just adjacent to downtown? Uh, we are a mixed use uh, retail. Uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, is very healthy. Uh, the office market continues to, to strengthen residential, a uh, tremendous uh, effort. Uh, the price of entry for all this, of course, has been safe and clean, and that's where we spend a good deal of our uh, efforts here at Downtown Cincinnati Incorporated. And now, instead of a Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 downtown, we're really looking at a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day downtown. Uh, I'm down here tonight. Uh, of course, it's an hour later. Uh, the streets are teeming with people. There's a performing arts center across the street. Uh, that's busy. There at Fountain Square, there's uh, salsa dancing out on the square. Lots of people out there. So uh, it's it, it's a mixed use, uh, mixed use downtown. So congratulations. It sounds like you solved all of your problems and you have the perfect downtown. Uh, you know, we had some very serious problems, and we've been very fortunate that the business community uh, and the city uh, and leadership uh, have really lined up and worked very, very hard in a very, very coordinated way for a very, very long time. And for years, you didn't see too much progress, especially in terms of perceptions. You know, we knew downtown was getting better, 
but we weren't seeing uh, the perceptions changing. But it's a little bit of a, a flywheel type of uh, effort that uh, as it begins to just keep moving, uh, all of a sudden, you know, every day there's some kind of a new opening, there's a new, uh, a new project getting going, there's a, we, we have many of our Class B office buildings now coming back as residential, uh, the riverfront is developing very, very nicely over the Rhine, the neighborhood just north of the Central Business District is, uh, is developing, and that's thanks to the work. Uh, we have a catalytic uh, economic development agency, the Cincinnati Center City Development Corporation has been very effective, especially in the over the Rhine area. Uh, we've had property owners, corporations putting a lot of resources into it. Uh, police uh, are our number one partner, so it's taken a lot of people in a coordinated effort. Okay, so as Alex just said, there's, uh, he, he challenged the notion that there's anything holding us back or that there's uh, anything that we need to remove as a roadblock in downtown. But for the sake of this discussion, advise us. Can you be our, our, our coach here? What would you say uh, you would advise St. Louis? And maybe what is your perception? of the St. Louis downtown? I, I think the toughest thing, uh, you know, our perception of the, St. of the St. Louis downtown is that it must be very similar to what Cincinnati is. It's a river city, a uh, big baseball town, r roughly the same type of weather and latitude. So uh, we see it as being very similar in many ways to, uh, to Cincinnati, uh, kind of a middle-sized American city. Uh, certainly, uh, we kind of set up something, a uh, hierarchy of needs where safe and clean is at the base of it, that the price of entry to any development is that people feel comfortable with the, with the development. Uh, we have to tell the story of our downtown, of our center city, and get everybody on the same page doing that. So we've benchmarked a number of other cities to do that, and I think the advice that I would give to any city, uh, you know, is number one, be, be yourself. Every city is unique different, uh, has its own set of issues. But uh, once you get focused on a strategy, uh, it's a long-term commitment. Uh, you may have naysayers, you may have critics, you may sometimes get frustrated at the, at the pace of progress. But if you leave it a little bit better every day than when you came in, uh, I think you'll be amazed and uh, in a very short time, uh, things begin to move very quickly. Talk a little bit about how you perceived yourself uh, you, how Cincinnati perceived itself uh, in the past and maybe now how that's changed. We've talked here on the show before about just kind of the narrative uh, that we talk about, that we tell ourselves, kind of our internal monologue sure. as a sure. city here in St. Louis. Have you, sure. do, you, do, you, do you deal with those issues? One of the things that Cincinnati has learned to do much better, and our Chamber of Commerce has played a major role in this, is benchmarking other cities. So we've been to places like Charlotte, uh, I've been to Milwaukee, we've been to Boston, uh, we're going to Austin this year, went to Denver. And one of the things that we're always amazed with is that people seem to be on the same page in many of these cities, and they do have a narrative about what makes their city special, uh, what makes it great. And so we've developed, a, it's called the Story Project. Again, it's something we're doing through our regional Chamber of Commerce here. Uh, we're working with companies like Procter & Gamble uh, and Citizens. We've looked at what are sort of unique about Cincinnati and trying to get everyone on the same page to sort of tell elements of the same story. A good example uh, is the concept of life-size heroes. Uh, Cincinnati, and I'd imagine St. Louis is probably very similar in this respect, uh, is the kind of city where you can walk around downtown and find several people that you might otherwise just read about in the newspapers or see on television, and they're approachable, that you can talk to them. Yeah. Uh, people like the owner of the Reds or right. Oscar Robertson. Uh, and uh, that's uh, Life Size Heroes is unique. David, I'm sorry, I, that's good. I have to cut you off there, though, because we packed the show with good stuff just like yourself. <laughs> okay, Thank good. you for your time. One thing you're mentioning on Twitter we should point out is that uh, in Cincinnati, both sides of the river are developed. Uh, in St. Louis, we have one side of the river that's clearly more developed than the other. David Ginsburg, Downtown Cincinnati Incorporated. Thank you very much. Now, before we talk about the future of downtown, Anne-Marie Berger is going to show us what's underneath downtown. The future of downtown has endless possibilities. There's entertainment, dining, shopping, loft living, and if David Sandal has it his way, downtown St. Louis will become a gigabit city. It's a, uh, a city which makes use of gigabit fiber to provide very high speed connectivity and economic development incentives to the future growth of a city. Access to high speed is the next round of advancement for the internet. The general thinking is by removing the speed barrier, more innovations will emerge, which will create more businesses and jobs, resulting in economic growth. And downtown St. Louis is the perfect spot for this to happen. During the late 1990s, we had the internet boom and a development boom here on Washington Avenue. 
and some smart people were thinking ahead and laid high-speed fiber during Washington Avenue's reconstruction. That's correct. It's already installed. It's in the ground. It's in many of the buildings. It's more of a matter of determining the right partnerships and coming up with a business model that will make it come into being. Okay, so this now is some of the fiber is, is being used by organizations and service providers, but most of it is untapped, and none of it is being used with the high-speed connectivity of a gigabit city. And right now, there is no plan of action to do so. There's been some conversations in pockets, but it hasn't been pulled together yet. Hopefully it would happen soon. It, is it moving in that direction, or is it still hypothetical? I, I would say it's moving in that direction. What happens if we don't? Well, this is the big thing. It, cities are starting to realize if they don't have this type of connectivity in the future, they will be off the roadmap of being part of the global economy. So that's why Chicago's jumping forward, Seattle's jumping forward, and why these other cities around the world are moving very aggressively to do this. And as you can see here on the map where these red squares are, these are the fiber access points. Sandal is also behind a similar effort along the Loop trolley line. But he explains that because we already have the infrastructure in place downtown, the fiber already laid, St. Louis has the opportunity to leap ahead of cities like Seattle and Chicago. And when you toss in the growth of St. Louis's innovation community and our downtown buildings as ideal locations for data centers, St. Louis could find itself on the global map. How hopeful are you? Um, personally, I'm quite hopeful. I, I think there's certain moments come up once in a while, every decade or two, where a door of opportunity just opens up. You have to just step into it. This is one of those moments. Uh, excellent job on Twitter. We've got a lot to talk about there. We'll help, uh, Ed will help us continue to curate that. Uh, okay, this is uh, downtown future, uh, if you will. Uh, Jay Soboda, um, the manager of the MX district, sorry, uh, Kent in the booth, I went out of order, I apologize. Carl Gunther from University of Missouri St. Louis Public Policy Research Center. Uh, Missy Kelly from the Partnership for Downtown St. Louis, and Patrick Brown from the Mayor's Office, le legislative liaison and um, just all things cool with Mayor Clay's office. It's kind of you. <laughs> other, than, other than the mayor himself. He's the coolest. I agree. <laughs> I'm not going to take anything away from him on that. He's, uh, okay, so let's just jump in and we'll see where this goes, much like the future. Where do you see St. Louis 10, 15, 20, maybe beyond? Well, my vision for the future of downtown St. Louis is that the next Jack Dorsey chooses to keep her company here in St. Louis in downtown because the talent is here and the people that want to work for her company live here. And we just heard about some Google, I mean, some gigabit fiber that might help that as there well. There you go. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the, you know, I mean, there, that, a company like that's going to want to live downtown because there's energy downtown. You know, it's about creating a sense of place. And I think, you know, there's examples of it sprinkled throughout, not just downtown, but through our, our city. And, you know, we are part of a bigger city. And so if we just think about the future of downtown without thinking about the success of neighborhoods that are successful, you know, Central West End, Cherokee, South Grand, Old North, you know, uh, I think we're missing out, you know, but downtown we have to have a density. We need 20,000 people in a square mile to create a 24 hour city and that 24 hour city is going to ex excite people about staying downtown. They're not going to feel unsafe because there's people on the street, there's strollers, you know, there's, there's plantings, there's urban gardens. These are the things that people are excited about, but it takes people and density to, to and do that. And that's there now. I mean, we have 14,000 yeah. people living downtown. That's double since 2000. And probably the biggest surprise to me when I started working downtown was that, was seeing baby strollers being pushed around throughout the day, I just had a different perception of what it was, and I think that that's a pretty common misperception across the region. I've seen a lot of baby strollers. I haven't seen a lot of uh, grade school through high school kids, though. That's true. Um, this August, though, there is a preparatory academy, academy opening um, that's going to be K through fifth grade. It'll be K through second in the first year, and then every year it'll add to fifth grade. So we're starting to build that infrastructure um, right. for sustainability, so that so that these people, these young people that we do have living down there, um, you know, they have they see downtown as an option as they grow in their lives and their families. Um, Education is definitely yeah. a headwind we face. Ten years ago, people were moving to Winsville. 
Now they're moving to Kirkwood, Glendale, University City, you know, and, and I think 10 years from now, they're going to be moving to downtown or because they don't want to, you know, it's more attractive. There's a better lifestyle. So, that, you know, we're progressing. We're moving ahead. That's really one thing that the mayor is cognizant of. Um, you know, he unleashed the sustainability plan on the city a few months back. It's a big plan. It's got a lot of strategies in it, one of which is to open 15 new charter schools citywide. I mean, we're not saying which neighborhood and where they should go or even really what grades they should be. I mean, we realize there's an array of, uh, of needs, you know, and so, you know, we want to open up these schools and get downtown be great, you know, yeah. absolutely. One thing I want to underscore is just the importance of achieving this vision. One thing that research shows us is that central cities um, if there's a large inequality in the economic dynamism and power of central cities versus their suburbs, the region at large has slower growth on average than places where there is more economic equality between the central city and its suburbs. And so it's important to achieve this vision, I think. Um, so I started yeah, the show by yeah. saying if you don't come downtown, this is still important to you. You're saying it is. It is, yeah. It's important. And then as if we do a good job in this, it's important to think about how we take that growth and help it bleed into the neighborhoods that surround uh, downtown. Because, like you said, I mean, we've got incredible number of fascinating, rich history, quality neighborhoods, um, and we need to keep growing the number of those if we want to what, buy Let's there. go back up for just one second to Cincinnati. What about the other side of our river? Is that important to our downtown? We, we are, or is our river bigger than, the, than, than in Cincinnati, and, and it's just physically harder to cross? Our, our neighbors are absolutely important, because I mean, you know, a, lot, a large portion of them work in downtown St. Louis, and vice versa. Um, so, you know, what affects us affects them, and what affects them affects us. So we need to reach across the river. I mean, there's, even nationally, there's a big Mississippi River focus right now, which, again, the mayor is a part of, uh, and looking at ways to help river cities just like ours activate their peace. Um, so, you know, ours is not as recreationally focused as maybe some of us uh, younger St. Louisans would like, you know, get out there and kayak or, or what have you. Fish, <laughs> maybe sketchy still, yeah. Um, yeah. but uh, it is a working river. It's very much active, and, and it's a big piece of our economic puzzle. I think you know the, the for the future of downtown from that perspective is you know when you look at the river, you know water is going to be a major issue moving forward across this country. This is you know it's it's fact, and we sit on a major water. It's going to make St. Louis a more valuable place, and where we're going to economically achieve, attract jobs, is when we can. Right now, we pass through a lot of things. You know we. We, they land here, we move them on, but we're not adding value to products. You know, so if we can attract people that are making products, add value to them. So rather than just passing grain up the river, let's turn it into bread. You know, and so that's where the opportunity comes, and where these other cities that have been successful is they create these, you know, multimodal, you know, transportation hubs, uh, warehouses that can store the stuff before it can turn into. Uh, you know, something that's more valuable, attract jobs here. Yeah, these aren't necessarily the high paying jobs that everybody chases after, but we have to realize, you know, kind of where we are in the country and where we are right now and just be really realistic about, you know, what people are willing to pay for, you know, for rent. You know, we've got 90%, you know, plus occupancy of apartments downtown. We're pushing a dollar thirty, dollar thirty five, you know, in rents at some of the nicer, you know, apartments downtown. But we still have people that need to live at four hundred dollars a month. You know, so we have this really diverse economic, and it just makes a really big challenge to figure out where do we put the priorities as we kind of chart a path forward. We have 10 seconds. Did any of you live downtown? I'm curious. I work downtown. Work downtown. Work downtown. Two and a half Which miles from downtown. Feels like a living, a living downtown. <laughs> Spend a lot of your lives sure. downtown. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Thank you all for joining us. Again, please don't go anywhere. We've got more to talk about, especially on the post show. Thank you very much. Ed, what's going on? We need your help. Well, Casey, I actually live downtown for my 10th year now going on, so I just want to say, put that in there. Well, listen, I want to say thank you to all those driving the conversation tonight. That's right. You're, you make the, the conversation move, and you have been doing a great job. Uh, you know, we've heard everything on Twitter from a region of rivers means a, a region of bri bridges. We also heard high speed means high tech jobs. Uh, and another thing I like, the Central Library, the brand new Central Library, what a big asset for the downtown region. But you know, some other comments like young people living downtown, will they remain there after graduation? Well, keep the conversation going. Of course, we have an after show. We want you to log on to our website, 9net.org slash stay tuned. Join us after the broadcast uh, and keep the conversation going using the hashtag stay tuned STL throughout the week. Uh, and please also visit our brand new website and let's see what you're continuing to say.
Okay, we're, we are back at the table with our community table. Welcome back. All of you have been here before. Regulars on the show, we'll say, but we'll introduce you anyway. Uh, Courtney Sloger, Joe Wilson, Sarah Thompson, and Jared Opsel. It may have been fast, but we want to get right to it. I'm going to get out of the way, but I'll start just because we haven't touched on the fact that your St. Louis University Law School is relocating yes. this semester yes. to downtown, bringing 2,000 students with it. Ish, I don't know the exact numbers. I've heard anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000, a okay. lot of part-timers. Okay, okay, take that topic and go. It's, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, I know there's a lot of other students who are too. As soon as they announced it um, a while ago, uh, two years ago, we were, I remember sitting in con law all the way in the back of the class and the professor's up front and he's trying to He's teaching really heady, difficult stuff to us. Every computer in the entire place was trolling through Craigslist trying to find apartments downtown. As soon as we got the email, everyone was ready to go downtown. Everyone was ready to drink there, to eat there, to school, go to school there, and to live there. Everyone was excited for it. I'm sorry, you say you, you do drink in law school. Is that what you just said? Uh, maybe <laughs> once, every now and then, when I'm not in the library. Are you going to stay there, though? Or is this, is this just a stopover, and is that good enough? And I oppose it, and I don't want to make this a one-on-one -on -one with Joe, but is that, do you think they'll stay? Does it matter? I think what Joe just said is exactly what downtown needs and what we're seeing is that long-term investment. We're seeing them dump millions of dollars in this building. They're going to be there long-term. We're seeing the arch grounds be redeveloped, 500 plus million dollars. That's showing investment in downtown. What that means is someone who's now, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have thought of ever living downtown. Now I'm looking for property. I want to stay there long-term myself because I see these investment from governments and from private entities. I think it's kind of like for have to kind of that we have to be discussing. I think um, some people also on Twitter brought some interesting issues. I always hate bringing this up, but I mean, the equality issue. I mean, we're talking about development, we're talking about all these things, but you do have to, let's be honest, I mean, St. Louis's history in terms of the race relations and economic inequality, I mean, those things are you scratch below the surface, and that is a lot why at the end of the day, you could throw $100 million into historic preservation, beautiful buildings, parks, green space, and if you still have issues with separation, jobs, crime, and I hate bringing this topic always back, coming back to it, but I do think it lives right there beneath uh, the surface. I mean, it really does. Well, it crossed my mind when in Jim's package uh, early in the show in, in the 1960s, and it was just like this u utopia of downtown. Well, not really. I mean, not everybody I came mean, downtown, if you will, yeah, or, or, well, and they didn't go to the same places. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it's important to remember that downtown is a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that the conversation wasn't simply about just development or just the negatives. But you know, it's a dynamic, changing neighborhood, which means mm -hmm. people move in and out. Mm -hmm. There's, di you know, there's demographic differences, and some of the things that need to be addressed are just neighborhood mm -hmm. issues. It comes down to, uh, are, do residents feel they have a voice? Do they, are, do they feel connected to the people that represent them in government? Do they feel like they know their policemen and the folks who are working there? So it's a lot of the same issues in any other city neighborhood deals with. You know, the more that people feel connected and they feel like they have a meaning and a purpose in a place, the more that they invest in, the more that they want to live there, the more that they want to, you know, look out for things like crime and other issues. So I think that reminding ourselves that it's a neighborhood and that it, there is multiple facets of how we can improve it, it's not just about development, it's also about the individuals and the people and what can we do on an individual level and a neighborhood level to make downtown a better place. I think place. one thing on the development side, what some of the developers have taken uh, notice of is there are low-income housing tax credits. I actually live in a mixed-income building mm -hmm. where there are subsidized rents, so it's affordable for people with lower incomes. I pay a market rate rent, so we have blue-collar and we have white-collar people living in the same building. We have retirees and we have young professionals and we have people going to college. So that little building that I live in is actually a tiny community that everyone's used to with you know someone who's retired, someone who's working their way through school. And we're seeing developers take advantage of that. There are about four or five buildings I can think off the top of my head that have this incentive for people looking for places to live downtown. But is there more riding on the success of this particular neighborhood for the rest of the region? You say it's a neighborhood, but it's not like the, it's in its own little bubble. No, hmm. there's, it's, the success of downtown is tremendously important for the whole region, for St. Louis County and for St. Louis City and for East St. Louis too. Uh, we get stuck in this idea that it's a zero-sum game, that the success for the city means a failure for the county or vice versa. It's not like that. Uh, success for one of us means growth for the entire region because 
companies moving into downtown, not everybody wants to live downtown. Not everybody wants to live in the city. Sometimes they want the county, and that means residents in the county too, or vice versa. Maybe somebody's got a job in the county and they really like city living. It's, it's, it can be success for all of us. We have to stop believing that success for ones means failure for the other. Well, it's important to remember that a, the downtown for most cities is still the heartbeat of the city. And the first sign of life that people look towards is the health of the downtown area. And a good example would be in Detroit where there's a lot of wealth and a lot of business in the suburbs of Detroit, but people tend to think about the health of the downtown area as being sort of the, the canary in the coal mine or the linchpin that, that determines the success of the entire region. And I think downtowns are like that because they're concentrations of business, they're concentrations of culture, and so people think of them as being the showcase of the region. And I think it's important that everyone feel that sense of ownership and understand why it's important that we embrace the changes that happen in downtown, why we, we look to what's happening and be invested in what happens in downtown, whether it's the arch grounds redevelopment or it's art and entertainment or the slew law movement. Those kind of things are important to all of us because at the end of the day, it's sort of our face front. It's our marketing that we put out to the rest of the country that says, look what St. Louis is doing. Look at the energy that St. Louis is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, why mm -hmm. is it important that these startups are in downtown mm -hmm. St. Louis? Mm -hmm. Because it communicates to the rest of the country that St. Louis is, is moving forward, that we're moving, you know, we're moving past some of our challenges and we're looking towards the future. And that's not to say that we don't address, mm -hmm. you know, issues. There are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of problems to address. But all communities have problems they have to address. And I think it's important that we sort of realize that the idea of be yourself that the mayor from Cincinnati said is, I think, hugely important because that's really, I think, how that we can embrace St. Louis and especially in the downtown area. Yeah, and you said uh, someone even on Twitter was saying, you know, don't underestimate the power of, uh, of marketing. And so, yeah, I think if you put forth an idea, but same time, we have a lot to battle against because my goodness, it's like how many times nationally is it like St. Louis crime? Safety, everyone's, you know, that's kind of the comment still coming up. So it's hard to talk about one issue again without really realistically like addressing other problems. I mean, you know, and being, cause it is, it's like we, I, we have a beautiful downtown. I love our architecture. I tell people all the time and a um, huge fan of Michael Allen. <laughs> Shout out. Like just love the history of St. Louis, learning about it, sharing it with other people. But you cannot tell other people in this entire region how great it is when all they hear is, you know, crime and shootings and someone was robbed and cannot convince them of it. So I do think we have to, in this topic, discuss those issues too. We can be the butt of a joke for the nation for whatever top mm -hmm. 10 worst of list that somebody comes out with. We can the people who really are going to listen to some of those things, like that the, we're one of the top ten most sinful cities in America or something like that, yeah. if they're really swayed by that... I, I, the top that's, ten sinful cities, but crime people are swayed sh by. Sure, but then they should also do a little more digging and know that our crime stats are wildly... Yeah. Uh, again, they're not. that's the issue of perception. perception. I mean, yeah. think about how Times Square used to be perceived mm -hmm. and the changes that happened. A lot of that was perception over time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why leadership and things like that are so important because you need people coming out there and saying, you know, we're going to put this forward. We're going to put this right. sort of confidence and hope forward and really push that line because over time, that's how perception changes. Mm -hmm. That's how culture changes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just about reality isn't the only part of the key. Perception is an important Absolutely. part of changing the reality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, we'll leave it there. I think that was a good spot. Thank yeah, you all very much. Don't go anywhere. Uh, let's go back to social media, though, to see what you're saying there.
Well, I think that then and now is uh, fairly self-explanatory transit there. Uh, we're joining us now in the studio, Andrew Thyssen, the director of the Institute of Urban Research uh, right here locally at the Southern Illinois University Edwardsville That's right. campus. Thank you for being here. Let's kind of bounce off of that because we had a Twitter comment too that the Metrolink is a little underutilized, maybe a little underrecognized in that it's under the ground. Uh, how much does <laughs> transit play a, a role in tonight's conversation? I think transit plays a gigantic role and a very important role because the key to any economic success is getting people with disposable income to the places that have stuff to buy and sell and, and, and enjoy. And so having a good transit system helps people come down, enjoy the amenities of downtown, while they can also return to wherever they're comfortable. Okay, so do we still uh, buy and sell much in downtown? Because we know we just lost our Macy's, but they had a lot of history in downtown. What do you make of that? Well, you know, every downtown serves a social, economic, and political purpose. And society's changing, and the economy's changing, and government's changing, but downtown, we're still driving on the roads that were mapped out 100 years ago or more, and we're still using some of the same buildings and infrastructure, so we have to be very creative in how we reuse these wonderful assets. So whether it's transportation, we need to keep up and adapt to new transportation. If we have different kinds of retail, we need to adapt and offer those different kinds of retail. Maybe we move out of traditional structures and we move into street vendors more or sometimes like the, 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 the mobile food vehicles. You know, there's, there's bringing food to people, which is a wonderful idea and something new and different. So Macy's, the old Macy's store might represent an old way of doing business. Mm -hmm. And I think consumers today might expect something different. Okay, so you studied downtown. You've been in the New York Times, you've been on the News Hour, you've been contributor and author to several books about our region. I'm curious yourself, you live in the Metro East perhaps? Nope, you... I, I live in De Pere. Okay, so your relationship to downtown, how do you, as someone who studies this, how, how does it come into your life? I, I love downtown, I love the institutions downtown, I, any excuse to make a trip downtown. It's, it's fun, it's enjoyable, uh, came downtown for fireworks over the 4th of July, it is a, uh, it's a wonderful asset. I love being here. And is it important? We've heard people say, I, 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 I posed at the beginning of the show that it was. We've heard people back that up. Do you agree? And if so, I'm, gonna, I'm guessing you're going to say yes. But if you do agree that it's important to the entire region, tell me why. Help, help me believe that because Clayton is doing pretty good by itself over there as its own business district. So is uh, Chesterfield Valley looks pretty healthy as well from a pure money standpoint. There are lots of, of success stories around the region that we can point to, but there's only one downtown. And you know, this baseball stadium that's downtown, that serves Metro East. That's St. Charles County's baseball team too. And it's St. Louis County's, we all share that. We all share the Gateway Arch. We all share the wonderful museums and the assets that are, that are in and around downtown. So is it a problem if they're only coming downtown for those things, or is that just the time when that neighborhood, as it's been described, is inviting guests in? A little bit of both. I think that we have to keep in mind that, that consumers are always going to be changing their mind. There's nothing that we can do that's going to have 20 or 30 year impact because consumer choices change too much during that time. But what we can do is keep up with these consumer choice, uh, these changes in consumer choice. And what I really think we could do that would be very smart is to be more adaptable. Someone talked about the importance of leadership, and it does come down to leadership. Good leadership that is, that is nimble and that, and, and that has the resources to invest to, to keep up with change. Successful cities keep up with change. Okay, so are we nimble enough? And can you give me an example of what you mean by that? Um, the first example that comes to my mind about being nimble is actually an old example from St. Louis, but when it had to do with graffiti. Graffiti, there was, there was a, a team that would respond immediately and clean it and get rid of it. And that's the kind of fast response. I mean, today we're in the, we're in the social media age, and it would be nice every time there's, a, there's some kind of a negative report coming out about St. Louis, it would sure be nice if we could respond to it immediately and stay on top of that and put the positive side of downtown out there or the positive side of St. Louis. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer, let's not underestimate a good marketing plan. 
because if we hear enough of the bad news, we start believing it. But you know what? If we start putting our good stuff out there, people are going to believe that. Narrative is something we've talked about more than once on this show, and I'm, I'm starting to uh, believe that that's going to be something we're hearing about uh, more. It's, okay, we have 30 seconds. Give me your vision for the next 10, 15, 20, however far you'd like to take it. What do you see downtown as in the future? I think downtown is on the rise. I think we have 10 or 20 very good years ahead of us downtown. I think there's wonderful investment on the horizon, both public and private, and that's a very important mix to have. I think that St. Louis is poised to have something of national or even global significance again. I think back to the Papal Visit or, or the Olympic Festival. I think that's in our future. Andrew Thysine, thank you so much for your time. We are out of time. We appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. Good night.